Hi everyone, this is part two of my guest appearance on the Paul or Nothing podcast where we talk in depth about Paul McCartney's 1989 documentary Put It There, the one that was made to accompany the release of Flowers in the Dirt. If you've not seen part one yet and you want to have a look at that, there will be a link up there or it'll be down in the description for you to go and see that. But this is part two and we're going to go deep into this from now on. It's audio only because it's a podcast. Thank you for watching. Let's... Uh dive into the film and with okay. me it opens with paul basically saying there's no better than working with john lennon yeah is that where it starts with you or is that that little bit of chit chat at the start there's a little bit at the start that i think we alluded to earlier um his sort of environmental phase where yeah. really i think i think what it is it's just taking a couple of clips that appear in the documentary and just showing you them up front so it's nothing that doesn't appear later on yeah uh, so yeah, yeah. There's, there's things like where he's saying, um, you know, you've got to be ecologically minded these days, otherwise you're not going to be here much longer. You know, and, and then and then, and then like, I think yeah. it does say you can't get better than working with John Lennon. I do believe that. So yeah, th- those are bits that I think do reappear later on, but it's just sort of setting the scene a little bit. Uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to be the most practical statement ever. That does it because I mean you've just done a collaboration with Elvis Costello, and it's going to sour any future collaboration you have, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely. Yeah definitely but like he says it's kind of probably the nearest thing that it had to it since then the fact that he was working with a, a sarcastic scouser who, yeah. <laughs> prob- who can probably get um who probably tells you when he doesn't like something that probably appealed to him and i, I, I seem to i remember reading an interview not too long ago a couple of years ago maybe where it was talking about uh you know that they they wanted to bring somebody in to work with paul as a songwriter because of these these issues that he'd had over the last few years where everything he did didn't seem to be gold anymore that they wanted to sort of try and get him with somebody who who he could work with and collaborate with and and really sort of make a name for himself as a new kind of partnership and and elvis turned out to be that man i've never seen someone resist becoming a legacy artist quite like mccartney in the 80s you know he went down fighting the entire way there was no like oh well you know I guess I'm just going to be like Jerry Lee Lewis and do the same hits for 90 years. It's so admirable. It really is. Yeah. I think everything up to and include in 1983, Pipes of Peace, it's new. This is what I'm doing now. And then the, the first sort of hints of it really are, are Broad Street, aren't they, where he, he reworks a few Beatles songs quite nicely, some of them. That might be a controversial opinion. But uh, I, I quite like some of the things that he did there with some of the old songs, not what he did with Silly Love songs. That was awful. But uh, yeah, eighty four is kind of the first, the first Cracking time where he armor, starts yeah. to he starts to look back a bit, and then I think the the, the odd live appearance that he made in the mid eighties, there was uh, Live Aid. He chose Let It Be, which I think you had to you couldn't really come on at Live Aid and say, "Here's my new single." It's coming out in a few months. <laughs> it's called Spies Like Us. Pretty little head. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You, you couldn't you couldn't do that at Live Aid. And um, Hillman, Hillman, you know. Yeah, and the fact that he had obviously technical issues at Live Aid just made, meant that it bombed and he didn't come out of that looking particularly great in the eyes of the public. Uh, Prince's then, Trust was good, though. Yeah, Prince's Trust the year after. So that was... I, I've heard him talk about that that was the first kind of thing that started giving him the like grain of an idea of going back out and performing live. So he, I, I heard an interview years ago. I think he was on the Steve Wright radio show. And he was talking about uh, Long Tall Sally, I, th- I think he did, at that mm-hmm. show, where he tried to do it in the original key. And he was like, I'm going to tell. No, I can't do that. I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell. <laughs> he said he had, to tell lo- about the he had result. to lower the pitch so much. He, he was like a bit shocked by it. And he's, he's tried to resist that ever since, hasn't he? Lowering the key mm-hmm. from what it originally was. But he it, it, it did say that that kind of thing, the prince's trust was you know he started getting thinking again about oh you know might might not be a bad thing to to play live and then of course the russian album going back and doing the old rock and roll songs that must have started a fire because a lot of what we'll talk about a bit later on is songs that you know he'd done a couple of years ago a couple of years previously on the russian album that he was still rehearsing with his new band and some of them even made it onto tripping the life fantastic and and were better than some of the Beatles songs on that album as well, if I'm not too blunt. Yes, uh, yes. Well, I certainly have some varied opinions that we will be covering. 
before we finish on some of those rock and roll songs and the performances that it did. A long time ago, I was in New Orleans. I met <laughs> Fats Domino. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, yeah, it, it was certainly a time where he was, um, he was trying to figure out who he could still be and still be relevant. Because if I think if he'd got it wrong at the end of the 80s, which I, don't, I think overall he didn't get it wrong, but if he had done, I don't know whether he... Would, would he have ever recovered and become the... A second Broad Street. Could he have recovered from a second Broad Street? Yeah. That is a yeah. very interesting question. Absolutely, yes. Now, you say he was trying to figure out who he was. Well, apparently, according to this documentary, he was considering Sea Moon for Tripping the Life Fantastic and the 1989-90 tour. Mm. I'm still a little bit sore that we lost the Sea Moon Little Woman Love medley from the uh, Wings to Over the World to Wings Over yeah. America. yeah. I love this song, always have. Yeah, it, it didn't really go back to any like medleys, did it? I, mean, I, I was listening to um, your podcast recently about uh, Tripping the Life Fantastic, and I think you were having to talk about uh, why didn't you do the uh, Venus and Mars rock show oh, jet yes. intro. And uh, I, I think, I, I kind of suspect, did he want to... Distance. D- distance, yeah, distance himself from that and say, you know, I'm not... I'm not going to become a Wings legacy act yet. I'll do some Wings songs, but I'm not actually going to copy sort of sp- specific things that Wings did. I think he wanted to sort of set himself out. This is me now. I'm, I'm embracing my Beatles past, and and this is what I've got for you. Uh, but so I think Sea Moon was. It's one of those songs that he loves to go back to. He doesn't seem to perform it in front of an audience much, but he loves it at sound checks. Yeah. It's certainly one of his soundcheck favourites, and it does seem to crop up uh, throughout the years. Uh, and it's, yeah, I kind of guess it is a little bit of a surprise. It's not on Tripping the Life Fantastic, is it? It must have been a soundcheck somewhere. Yeah. Um, though Definitely. I've never heard it on the various illegal, illicit, expanded versions of Tripping the Life Fantastic, so mm. maybe not. At least we got Inner City Madness, you know? <laughs> Mm, yeah um, great <laughs> so, next up we have the tail end of the first performance of my brave face yes um, they were definitely pushing this single and one of our mutual friends uh dino who runs a fantastic facebook quiz uh, i actually saw a picture of him in london in 1989 and there were posters for my brave face yeah, yeah was that real or am i looking at a crazy alternative dimension no i think that sounds that sounds reasonable i know they were they were pushing these as big hit singles they didn't if i remember rightly and this is purely me going from memory did my brave face get to something like number 18 in the uk charts it wasn't Some, very high it was top it 20 was something like that um but he was certainly you know with all the publicity they, this big like eight hours on radio one that, that, that they'd managed to secure, which was a bit of a coup. They, they, were, they were really pushing him and publicising him as a as a person and, and his history. Oh, Richard and, Ogden smashing it at this point as a manager. He really is. Yeah, and we're definitely, even though we didn't maybe know it at the time, we are on that downward slope of Paul's singles charts career, mm-hmm. which, kind, which kind of finished with No More Lonely Nights. It was really... Oh, there was Pipes of Peace, No More... Pipes of Peace was number one. No More Lonely Nights, I think, was probably top five in the UK. And then after that, he's not really... He's not getting big singles after that. Ferry across the Mersey might count. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he, he has to... Yeah, it has to be connected to a tragedy for him to get a number one after, after that point. So, uh, but yeah, My Brave Face, it was... I mean, I certainly... Re- maybe I remember it as a big single because... I was becoming McCartney fanboy at the time. That's probably why. I don't know whether any of my mates would be would particularly remember it. Your ex does, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sick to death of it. Yes. So yeah, that you can see him working. You can see him working a lot on this song with trying to get the harmonies right. And this is the bit where they're sort of talking about that bit. Take me to that place. And he it's says, you know, less, it's really yeah. me and John. Uh, so he he knows what he's doing. He's he knew exactly what he was doing, saying that in that documentary. Uh, but but yeah, it's it's true, and and I think a lot of that was driven by Elvis Costello, who who fan, who fancied being involved in something a little bit like that. But you, you could certainly see them working on because because this was this was after the album was recorded. I've, I don't think there's any information available that says when this documentary was recorded, but I have little doubt that it's after the album was finished. 
and they were getting ready to mm -hmm. uh, rehearse for the tour. Well, there's an album version of Distractions that we're going to come across later. It's it's the yes. exact version. So I would I would uh -huh. presume you're correct there. Yeah. I will I will say there's a bit of a difference to the album version when we get to it. A little oh bit God, of folks, he's just coming on this podcast to make a fool of me. I knew it. <laughs> no, no. I knew it. It's a slightly oh. different mix to the album. Let's put it like that. But we'll we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So yeah, um, we actually come to the title card now. And Andrew, I love title cards that are in camera, and it's printed on a set. You yeah. know, either for an actor or a director. Yeah. And it's got no fanfare. It just you're just listening to the McCartney audio dialogue that you're listening to before. It's like oh. By the way, this is called Put It There. Yeah. I love a good Saul Bass or James Bond opening title sequence, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> I, I did appreciate the simplicity there. It was really nice. And again, in 1989, this looked really classy. Um, it's like a sort of a red font, isn't it, with a nice border outline, and it just mm. it just looked pretty nice. I, I think, um, yeah, it's probably, with what you're saying about Jeff Wanfar, I think he did pull out a really nice-looking documentary for this. Again, much nicer than it has any right to be, considering the probably lack of interest the uh, production company would have had in actually putting it together. Yeah. Then McCartney talks about My Brave Face again, uh, getting the old Hoffner bass out. I love it when he says, it's not very good at keeping in tune. I yeah. don't know why that's just a, a McCartneyism to me, just the way he said yeah. that. Yeah, because he's, he's, he talks about it being Elvis who persuaded him, doesn't he, to, to get the Hoffner out. And you can see there's little clips that are throughout this, um, especially towards the end where you, where you see them <clears throat> rehearsing stuff early on, where you can cl clearly see that Paul isn't using the Hoffner, he's using his Rickenbacker. Mm -hmm. So it must have been the case that probably Paul started off using the Rickenbacker, that maybe that was his go-to base at the time. And then at some point, Elvis has probably said to him, you know, why don't you get that out? So you can kind of see that play out when you, when you know... When you know the content of this documentary and the fact that that bit of him rehearsing with Elvis was actually probably a year or so before, or maybe two, two years yeah. before, yeah? When you know that, you can sort of see, well, yes, that the fact that he's playing a different bass to what Elvis told him to play kind of fits because this was probably before that bit happened. So, yeah, that's interesting to see. And I think this is also around about the time at this point where Paul also says um, that they'd taken more care over this album which is quite interesting, him almost sort of saying that we didn't take care on previous albums, which I'm sure can't be the case. But so, yeah, he says, uh, he says, I don't want to be stuck out in America somewhere plugging an album you don't like. And you think, <laughs> Press uh, the play. yeah, that, that you, you can, you can see what's going through his mind there about, uh, you, you can kind of tell what albums, I mean, in 1989, I wouldn't have known what albums he was talking about there, but uh, it's watching it now. You can, you can definitely, paint a picture in your own mind of what he was thinking there yeah thank god they didn't just do one take like with mumbo or anything how brave is it to bring out your band that follows the beatles and for your first two tracks to be mumbo and bit bop the, ball, <laughs> the balls of that man to do that incredible wildlife is so underrated i've actually grown to love mumbo over over the years yeah but for me, the highlight track will always be Love is Strange. Really? Yeah. The feeling of pure joy I had when McCartney's vocal finally starts about a minute and a half in. Yeah, it when, takes a while, doesn't it? People, like, I was like, oh, this is, this is so mellifluous. This is so sublime. <laughs> oh, it's great. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, at this point, I've realised, Andrew, that I'm not really paying attention to the film. I'm just paying attention to McCartney's nose rubs and uh, you knows. I mean, apart from the 1980 vinyl interview, this is probably the go-to piece of media if you want to get your McCartney impression down. Oh, it's great. It really is. Yeah, and, and on that on that point, this is probably, as far as I know, and again, whether anybody can uh, correct me here on this, he mentions at this point, when he's talking about work, working with Elvis, he comes out with one of his classic interview lines that he's come out with so many times since but i think this might be the first time that we ever hear paul say you know i come out with a line like it's getting better all the time and, and then john, john would say couldn't yeah. get much worse and he's you know how many hundreds of times every interview now it's like well when's he going to do when's he going to talk about getting better when's he going to talk <laughs> about the parrot on his shoulder during hey jude and, and but as far as i know this is the first time the first instance of him ever saying that that i ever saw 
and I've, I never had, se- I've never seen anything since that was that was recorded before this. That's so interesting. Like <laughs> patient zero of the McCartney anecdotes, you know. Yeah. If I ever had dinner with him, I would just have to sit and say, look, Paul, I know that John said you're not removing the movement you need is on your shoulder. I know that. Please talk to me about Magneto Entertainium, Anne. Uh, do you think he'd remember anything about it? Um, yeah, so uh, which one was the Crimson Dynamo? Is he in the X-Men? No, Paul, no! <laughs> Serious question. How cynical are you about all of his persona and stories? Like, are you taking it all at face value here, or are you in the back of your mind, working out what he's really saying and what the publicity spiel is? Or is it second nature for you at this point? It's tough because I, I, it's, it's almost impossible to consider how much is packed into his brain in terms of memories. And we know that they get muddled sometimes. And sometimes he'll come out with a story that um, any Beatles fan will know can't, actually physically can't be true. So it's quite difficult, but you think, I'm not going to criticise him because there's so many memories in there that how how can they all be stored properly in order? And how many is he not allowed to talk about that he might accidentally start talking about and then a publicist goes... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the one that he did a, a few years back that always tickled me was when he was uh, he was talking about... He, he, he was asked to sort of name a, a particular memory that he had, and he said, uh, he says, I always remember when we were in... Um, we were in a chalet in Austria when we were filming Help. And uh, there was me and John in this chalet in Austria. And we had a record player and we were listening to an acetate of Here, There and Everywhere. And you just think, oh, that, can't, that can't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost as bad as when he started playing too many people and said, this is for the Wings fans. Yeah, oh, I think Paul. Paul, Paul has a different idea of what Wings is to what the album credits have. Wings Greatest is the example yeah. there, if you need any further proof. And Wingspan as well, which goes up to about 1984. <laughs> Does it? I think... Oh, so it maybe, but, but maybe that's because Denny was involved in Pops of Peace. Maybe so. I think Paul Paul has his own opinion of what Wings is, and it doesn't necessarily tally with what we see on album credits. I imagine if we went up to Paul and like, oh, Paul, <clears> I, lo- I love that Beatles album, All Things Must Pass... I've got my own opinion of what the Beatles are. It might be different to yours, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, a lot of these stories have become the story is the truth because it's been said that many times. Mm. But uh, w- whether, jo- whether John ever did, I mean, I, I, you can imagine John going, couldn't get much worse. It sounds like a John kind of thing, doesn't it? So uh, I've, I've never had cause to doubt that. But, yeah, I'd like to hear some different stories. Oh, the fact that we're never going to get a definitive answer about Eleanor Rigby and In My Life is probably going to cause civil wars in the future, you know? Yes. Yeah, so it's difficult. It really is. Um, and th- these are old memories and it's uh, they must be difficult to store. I, I, get, I get my own life wrong quite often, I know, so I can't really blame him if he does as well on his own. Then we come to... The demo recording of My Brave Face, the second time we see it, we actually get to see Elvis Costello sing. And for someone who was kind of unceremoniously not really included all that much on the final album, especially in terms of vocals mm-hmm. until the archive release, it, 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 this must have been killer footage for everyone back in the day. I imagine so. I mean, I, I, I wasn't particularly an Elvis Costello fan. I didn't, I didn't follow him at all, so... I imagine for the Elvis fans, it was great. I, I doubt he got on primetime TV documentaries very often. <laughs> but uh, I, re- I, I love some of those demos that they were doing at the time. So, yeah, the My, My Brave Face, when he's he's bashing it out on the uh, on the acoustic guitar and Paul's there in, in the booth with his bass. There's also, on, on the archive collection, there's uh, like some extended footage of all this, which is really good, where you see uh, you see Elvis playing, I think it's My Brave Face again, but then you've got Paul on keyboards just bashing out this really sort of really loud, harsh keyboard riff all the way through it. And them doing things like Tommy's Coming Home, which was... Wow. Why, why that didn't make the album, I've no idea. Uh, that, that is a strange decision. We needed, we needed Motor of Love. We needed that. Mm, that well, mm. motor, of, motor of Love is... If, if I was to name my three most hated Paul McCartney songs and uh, Motor of Love is, is a shoe in for that. Is that just because it is literally the most ridiculous concept for a Paul McCartney song ever? 
that, that and it's hideous. <laughs> Why couldn't US? I always pronounce. Everyone laughs at me. I know that I cannot pronounce this song correctly. US. US. Uwe. Uwe. Le Sole. Uwe Le Sole. That should that should have ended the album. Oh, it's fantastic, and it, it, it annoys me that that's not on the vinyl version. So it's on the CD, but not on the vinyl. Thank so, God it's on the um, figure of eight uh, B-side, at least. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I've got about eight different versions of Uwe La Sole. Uh, it's crazy, but whenever I listen to Flowers in the Dirt on vinyl, it's always a major disappointment to mm-hmm. me that Uwe La Sole does not finish the album, because the album that I grew up on has Uwe La Sole at the end. The, ca- the cassette and the CD both had that. I'm sure there's someone out there that says, no, all my trials makes Tripping the Life fantastic. I cannot listen to that album without <laughs> all my trials. Good grief, yes. I'd, I'd, actually, speaking of that album, do you have both the highlights and the original? Yes. So I got the original probably the day it came out. and But I didn't pick up the highlight album until probably about five or six years ago. I went through a bit of a phase where if there was any any versions that had any different edits of anything, and then I, I was just sort of hoovering them up for a pound on eBay, uh, so I did I did get the highlights just because um, this just because yeah yeah, yeah. yeah well, well just because just because this weird part of me needed to have it not for it I can't remember if there was anything is all my trials on there because I've, yeah, I've got it's the uh, unique track I believe right well I've got the two all my trials singles <laughs> so. <clears throat> I, I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have uh, seeked out the highlights album at the time for all my trials because I had it anyway. No, um, I showed my friend recently that I'd bought a third copy of the Russian album, and he was like, yeah. "Sam, Sam, you're insane! You're an insane person!" What? <laughs> I'm like, "But it's pink! It's pink! Yeah. And it's what missing! The, and it's missing the best song." I'm gonna be a wheel someday. I was thinking of summertime. <gasps> oh, that's a nice dichotomy we have already good nice opposites there <laughs> uh yeah then we get some more comparisons to john and elvis i thought he was going to talk about that they're quite physically similar because there's that quip he makes about them both wearing glasses but um it, it was yeah. nice to see that he goes into the actual song songwriting process at uh-huh. least yeah then we come on to the tour rehearsals of my brave face again this is kind of like more like a mid performance yep i've got to ask you a nice question here mm. do you think linda's playing in any of this footage I imagine she is, but it must have been such a relief to her at this point to have Wix there. <laughs> but for, for various reasons. I mean, firstly, obviously, so that he can handle the, the tricky stuff and she can just bash out a C chord or something. But also, I, I got the impression that Linda and Wix really got on very, very well. And he must have been just a great support for her, rather than, you know, if she needed to know, well, how do I how do I play this? How do I play that? Rather than having to go to Paul That's all so the true. time, that that yeah. she that that she could she could get that from Wix, and I'm and I'm sure probably Wix part of Wix's job description was see, sort, see, sort see Linda, Linda through this, yeah. yeah. And I think to this day, Wix has a lava lamp that he has on stage next next to him. That's um, like his memory of Linda. It's there really? for Linda. Yeah. Oh my God, that's so touching. Wow. Yes. So I think, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think it was definitely Wix and Linda was, was a good partnership. She could probably concentrate on doing the things that she was comfortable with. Yeah, when I had the rather notorious author Jeffrey Giuliano on the show, he, in no uncertain terms, just declared that everything was programmed prior for Linda and she's just pretending to touch keys. I'm not <laughs> sure how true that is. Mm. But I don't, I don't think Linda would have accepted that. Yeah, I mean, she played, I mean, as simple as it is, she's there going dun, da, 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 dun, da, da, yeah, yeah. on wildlife, you know, that's still her. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, she, she'd been she'd been in a massive band touring the world for, what, sort of seven years or so on and, on and off. She must have learned a fair amount during the 70s. It's not like he's making a do maybe I'm amazed solo or the, no. or the you know, anything, anything like that. As funny as that might be. Uh, <laughs> take it yeah. away, Linda! Yeah. yeah. She, so, has to, uh, she has to like a jazz piano solo or something. <laughs> or uh, Riders on the Storm. <laughs> yeah, she, I, think, I think Linda, yeah. It's, her, her and Wicks definitely worked well together. But yeah, that, that version of My Brave Face, it's, it's good to see them working it up in the studio. But it's interesting, again, the fact that you know that the album's been made at this point, but there's still clearly 
they're, they're really trying to nail it and, uh, and make sure they can get it right live. Because I yeah. suppose, it, cause I, I, I mean, I've, I've been in a few recording studios and done bits and pieces, and there's a massive difference between doing 20 takes of something and getting it right eventually so that it can go on a record than actually standing in front of an audience mm-hmm. knowing, knowing that you can do it. He's, no, but he's probably got, you know, horrible memories of the 1979 Wings tour, though. You know, he's like, I'm never going unprepared on tour again. Yeah. You know, yeah. even though there is extensive footage of them rehearsing for the Japan tour that never happened. But yeah, definitely Paul Wu has still got a bit of back to the egg PTSD for sure. Yeah, definitely. And there's a bit there's a bit at this. Well, there's a bit at this point again where he says something. Um, he, he carries on talking about sounding like the Beatles. I think it's again when when they've been doing My Brave Face and that mm-hmm. and that little bit that sounds like him and John. And I never quite knew in what context he meant what he says here, because he says um, he says about sounding like the Beatles, and he says, "Well, you know, if anyone's allowed to do it, it's got to be us. me and the lads." <laughs> and, he, and he sort of points backwards with it with his thumb when he says the lads. And I've st- still to this day, I'm not quite sure whether the lads, like Hamish, Robbie, and and those that are back in the studio, or whether he's pointing at George and Ringo. I'm sure I've read that quote elsewhere in direct reference to George and Ringo. That's right. where I'm going to chuck my one pound bet in that direction. I'm not a gambling man, yeah. but if yeah. I was, I'd guess he meant them too. Yeah. It's just the way he says, and the lads. And yeah. like, who, who do you mean by the lads? Yeah. Sure. You can't call Ringo the lads. He's older than you. Yeah. So um, I kind of went the other way and thought he's probably talking about him and the band. If anybody's allowed to do it, it's me and the guys that I'm working with. But then you think, if he did mean that, well, that's a bit harsh on George and Ringo. They're allowed to sound like the Beatles as well. That's very interesting. Mm. God, there's so many questions I've got to ask Paul when I eventually <laughs> find his email somehow and hack it. Yes. We move then on to Trevor Horn and Steve Lipson and the production of Rough Ride and how mm. he didn't want to take three months to uh, produce a single. Are they referring yeah. to Relax there? I think they're, they're definitely talking about one of the Frankie singles and you'd imagine... You'd imagine probably it's relax or two tribes then. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was kind of, I'm I'm the perfect age, and I mean to within a year, I'm the perfect age for Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And that uh, was like a, a, a one album wonder, wasn't it? Yeah, like it, it, it was one year of just Frankie Goes to Hollywood, and then you never saw him again. Yeah, and I was kind of, I was like the only kid at school who didn't like Frankie Goes to Hollywood. <laughs> relax okay you know yeah i just thought I, I just i just just didn't do anything for me at all so yeah it was he didn't want to get bogged down doing something like that which you can understand from the the guy who the first album he made was made in a day i've got that written down in my notes as well andrew right <laughs> yes uh, well i didn't i just thought of it just then oh, oh, um, oh, stop but, making me look silly. but yeah rough, rough ride's an interesting one on here um, I, I like the way that paul sort of plays just a little jam of it on his guitar for a few seconds just to sort of show how simplistic it was and how little of an idea they had to work with. I think he kind of shoots himself in the foot a little bit there because like, and even he kind of insinuates that I probably should have picked a different song to demonstrate on camera. Yeah, maybe so. And then, and then, it, then it cuts to it. And I, th- I really like what you see on the documentary of them mm. doing Rough Ride. Uh, I think it's really interesting the close-ups that you see of Robbie and the chords that he's playing to get that it certainly made me think for example when i was when i was watching this last week again for the hundredth time i'm thinking oh yeah i'm I'm gonna try and play those chords and see if i can get that sound uh but i think it's a really nice version i think this is a song that kind of overachieves Hmm. in the era i think in terms of because it is it's just it, it is a deep cut let's make no bones about it uh there's not a single non-paul mccartney fan in the world who's who who knows of the existence of this song probably <laughs> it is the bit bop of flowers in the dirt especially yeah. since it is the second song as well and to to get such a prominent role here where you hear a, a real good chunk of the song for it to follow jet right near the start of uh, of tripping the life fantastic i think it's yeah i think it's overachieved in life as this song but i i personally like rough ride it's uh, it's a bit of the album I look forward to, but I just think uh, it's it's done very well for itself here. It's like that person who's become a millionaire without having any talent to achieve it. It's it's done pretty well for itself. Yeah, 
I love the Tripping the Life Fantastic version as well. It's one of, it's one of the many songs that sounds better than the album version. Yeah. Then they go on to talk about one of the other collaborations, Figure of Eight. Yeah. And how he wanted a stronger sound for that, which is weird because the weakest mix of that song ends up on the album. Yeah, there's a lot of versions of this song, isn't there? Um, obviously, you've got the, what you hear on this documentary, where, where I um, mentioned they've got like this blue wash that they put over the screen that I always really liked for no obvious reason. There's, there's single versions, album versions, live versions, B side versions. Yeah. yeah, I've got I've got the lot. I saw it's another song I've got a lot of versions of. Have you got the etched single? Yeah, I, th- I think I've got them all. I've got a little mini wow. single, mini three inch disc. I've got I've got a lot of versions. <laughs> I, I, yeah. So I really like Figure of Eight as a song. Um, again, I, I, don't, I wouldn't use the overachieving tag here, but I was surprised when it was used to open the show and open the album. You're not alone there. I think yeah. everyone was surprised, you know. Yeah. He'll open, he'll open with Sergeant Peppers, obviously. Yeah. I, I did see Paul on this tour. My first Paul McCartney show was, I, I don't think I've mentioned this yet. My first Paul McCartney show was, I think it was, it was either the 8th or 9th of January 1990 at the Birmingham NEC. So you saw Inner City Madness then? Yeah, well, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't remember a great deal about the show. It was, it was only a few weeks after that I came to the realization that I was completely blind and needed glasses. So I didn't. So I didn't. <laughs> I thought really you were going to s- say blind drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really see anything of. The, I have no visual memory of the show at all because I couldn't see anything. <laughs> but I didn't realize that my eyesight was that bad, and it was. Um, it was kind of a, a disappointment when I stepped into the arena because it was my first it was my first occasion where I'd gone to a show and the standing area was all seats. Oh no. And that's always it's like oh god that's that, this is the audience they're expecting. You know we we have to we have to sit down on the floor of an arena. Um so it immediately sort of makes you think that you're at an old man's show I think doing that. So, but, but I, I don't want to say, I, I, I don't want to diss the show because, you know, this was my first show. This was my first time seeing Paul McCartney, even though I couldn't actually see him and I'll treasure it forever. But I've got better memories of seeing Paul McCartney live than that. What, uh, what other times have you seen him then? So I saw him in Liverpool on the 1st of June, 2003, which was the last leg of that world tour. And that was so great. It was down on the, it was King's Dock. I think it's all built on now. I think, I think that might be roughly where the arena is now in Liverpool. Yes, I think I may have stayed in one of those shitty built on the, on the uh, waterfront flats whilst yeah. my, whilst my girlfriend at the time went to a Lana Del Rey concert and I snuck out and went to the cavern. Yeah. Well, good choice. Well played. <laughs> so yeah, I went, I went to that which was great because it was it was end of the tour it was in liverpool and he just bust out things like uh honey hush and various things he said oh yeah we used we used to do this down the road at the cavern <laughs> i just, oh this is fantastic so yeah saw him there in liverpool i then saw him in sheffield and it was it was the first time he'd ever done getting better live in the uk wow. now getting better is one of my top 10 beatles songs and unfortunately, we were right on the back row, so we were a long way away. But that, I, I, I had a little cry at that point, I'm going to admit, because it was a beautiful moment. Seeing one of my favourites, him do that song for the first time ever in this country was uh, a bit much for me. And then I saw him at Anfield uh, when he headlined the European City of Culture in uh, June 2000, or end of May or beginning of June 2008. That's the last time I saw him, actually. But we, yeah. um, it was right up near the front. Me and my cousin right up near the front. Uh, that that was great, and it was it was really weird because it had been really really thick dark clouds all day. It was threatening to absolutely throw it down. And a few minutes before Paul walked on stage, the clouds parted. Oh, and you just think, good day sunshine. Yeah. Well, you think I've I've heard about these chemicals that can be put into clouds. Is, <laughs> is McCartney controlling the weather? in liverpool tonight i wonder and i, I don't know but I mean, it was it was very suspicious 
he might have the rain stick that Keith Richards has that always <laughs> stops 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 the rain. You know. Yeah, yeah it was it was just it was just a bit too perfect to be real. <laughs> no. Uh... I can remember going in to see McCartney in 2018 thinking, I'm not going to go wow at the explosions in Live and Let Die, <laughs> and I'm not going to cry when he does yesterday. And I did both of those things immediately. Yeah. Yep. And I was waving my hands with, hey, Jude. And, <laughs> you know, I hate his stagecraft, but when he pointed at my section of the audience to go, yeah, 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 you can bet your ass I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course you did. Of course you did. you got to do you got you got to do and since it was the the last show of the tour not only did he do wonderful christmas time but ringo and um ah. ronnie wood came out as well ah brilliant that's great to see him and ringo we, we we knew at the the 2008 liverpool show we knew that uh, it was rumored that there was going to be a special guest appearing with him so we'd been sort of scouring the internet and music magazines to see who's who's in the country at the moment who's who's on <laughs> who's on tour and we'd kind of narrowed it down to Neil Diamond. I'm thinking, surely, I can't, I can't see that it'd be Neil Diamond, but that's all I could figure out it was going to be. And it turned out it was, it was um, I think, the first time that him and Dave Grohl appeared on stage together. I was just thinking Dave Grohl in my head as like a weird yeah. throw, throwaway answer. I can't fucking believe that. It was so Dave Grohl. That's Dave amazing. Grohl came on. He did, he did one song on drums. I can't remember. What was it? Might have been back in the USSR. I can't quite remember. And then I think it was Band on the Run where he came and played guitar at the front with Paul. And you just, the joy on his face at how happy he was to be there doing that made it just perfect. You can tell Dave Grohl's a huge Beatles fan. Not only oh, because he, 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 he defends Ringo's drumming at every turn, but his favourite songs, Hey Bulldog. That <laughs> means you're a deep cut Beatles fan. Like yeah. He didn't say, oh, I like Let It Be. He's like, I love that one rocker off the album no one likes. Yes, yeah. Dave Grohl. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Good for you. So, yeah, I've had some good fun seeing uh, seeing Paul live, including Figure of Eight at the beginning of that show in Birmingham. When everyone went, huh? Yeah, yeah what's I this? Can... I, I didn't expect to be going for a toilet break at this point in the show. Oh, but... you know, I call it the My Valentine break. Because <laughs> I'm not going to lie, there was about 50 of us at the toilet during, during, during that moment. And really? The kiosk stands were all full. Then we come on to uh, Paul discussing the fact that the Beatles are on CD now, which is a fantastic little time capsule moment. Like, oh, the Beatles are on CD now, you know? Yep, yep. And okay. then we come on to things we said today, which yep. would also appear on Tripping the Life Fantastic. Uh, cracking little rendition of this one, but he actually does change it slightly, which is interesting to see. Yeah. Like we've already talked about changing the pitch and how rarely he does that, but... Yeah, uh, really. this kind of reminded me, you know, when on Wings Over America, he really does a, a really shitty version of I've just seen a face and completely changed the tempo. Yeah. Here he does the kind of the same thing without ruining the song. Yeah, it, it's interesting version. I, I wouldn't have known this song when I, before I saw it on this documentary because I didn't start really buying Beatles albums until the following year. So I'd never heard of this song. I just knew that it was one that he was introducing as an old Beatles song. And that was as much as I knew about it. So, so I kind of got to know this version and this, this sort of quite loose arrangement of it before I ever knew, before I ever heard A Hard Day's Night. So I, I, I completely came at it the, the other way around, really. I tell you what, with Hamish's vocal being as strong as it is, I would have loved to have heard I'll Be Back on this tour. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the thing, and it is there's just too many songs for him to build in. And it's, uh, has there ever been anybody in history who can just leave out as big a songs as, as as he leaves out? I mean, you think of something like "She Loves You." It's it's still one of the biggest selling songs has ever been in this country, and probably in many countries. And he never does that song live, and nobody bats an eyelid. And he, he's got lots of million selling songs that he could just leave out of a concert and nobody would bat an eyelid. I just wish he had the, not bravery, because it's, it, it's not that. I just have a bit more faith in his fan base. Like, n the next tour, mm. no Let It Be, yep. no Long and Winding Road, no Hey Jude, no Closing Medley, no Live and Let Die, yep. no Let Me Roll It, yep. and we'll I'd see what happens. I'd love know? that. I, that that's, that's the one thing that would get me buying another ticket to one of his shows. Uh, I'm going to do Babies in Black, followed by So Bad. What? 
Yeah, more smooths than the Grey Goose. I want that in there. Don't play with my heart there, Andrew. <laughs> Don't play... If he played Morse Moose and the Grey Goose, even with his shot voice, even if, you know, like, you know, at the end of Deep Down where he could kind of fake the gruff voice. Yeah, yeah. If he did that, if if I walked into the stadium and all I heard was, I think I'd have a heart attack. It would, it would, I would, I would love to, I would love to write a Paul McCartney set list and say, this is what you're doing. Get it learned. Get it learned. Yeah, all right, all right, Andrew. You know. <laughs> just, just think of me as the bassist in the band, you know. Yeah. No, that that would be that would be great. So, yeah, things we said today, like I say, I got to know this version on this documentary before any other. So, uh, yeah, but like you say, this is this is kind of the section where we're doing tour rehearsals. He does. I saw a standing there. Next. Yeah, and and, he, and even earlier track, and uh, he basically says you can't really recapture the magic of the Beatles. And then it immediately cuts to a rendition of the long and winding road where they kind of capture the magic of the Beatles. Yeah. So, I love his, uh, I love his quote that he says there. He says, you can't reheat a souffle. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the middle class, uh, Paul coming at, coming out there. Yeah. You know, as a, uh, as a uh, Linda says, you know, you can't reheat a pheasant. <laughs> oh, really, Paul? Okay. A soy, a soy pheasant or something, you know? Yeah. The other thing I noticed about, and and I was sort of, I particularly looked at this time because it's it's the period of the documentary where he's he's rehearsing for the tour. So I was I was looking through the set list, and it sort of struck me that from that point there, of, of, of everything that came from nineteen seventy five six onwards, there are only two songs make it into this set list from the whole of that period, and that's coming up and Ebony and Ivory make it into the Trip in the Life Fantastic. Um, you don't you don't see either of those being rehearsed here, but it's just like he's you know we've got some band on the run tracks and then that's it apart from so he ignores so many albums and w- was that a very deliberate thing? I don't know. Yeah, it's either Toronto or some other place. He just says like yeah you know I'm just thinking what would I like to see if yeah. I went to a show and I'm like. Oh, Paul, you're the worst person to to like use that kind of logic on because you've got the most varied, demanding fan base of all time. Yeah. And he practiced with a little look with wings. Like, come on, give us with give us with a little look. I'd love I'd love to have seen that song played. Good by, night, yeah. good night tonight. Wow, with the lumpy trousers band. <laughs> come on, all hair slicked back. Oh. Yeah, I mean that would have been great. So yeah, that's. That's um, it's it's weird that he's rehearsing for a tour and he's pretty much, apart from two songs, ignoring the whole of the previous fifteen years. Also, something that bugged me at this point in the doc, I was like, "Oh, we're not getting any interviews with the band, are we?" Ah, oh, that's mm. a shame. No, you don't hear. No, <laughs> you don't hear. Any, you don't even hear Linda talking, do you? Nah, it's no. um. It's probably a missed opportunity, and if this didn't have to be truncated to a single hour, there would have definitely been room for that. But I'll bring up this point shortly again. We then move on to How Many People, a kind of rinky-dink little version. I don't mind this song on Flowers in the Dirt. I think it's it's kind of a... On the one hand, I want to say it's a nice little song, but then when you hear Paul talking about sort of who he dedicated it to and the kind of thinking behind it, like how many people have got to die before we take some action. It's quite a heavy, deep song, actually. So, yeah, he mentions that, and it's dedicated to Chico Mendes, one of the advocates for the indigenous peoples of South America. Yes. And they say the song is dedicated to him. I've I've scoured my entire copy of Flowers in the Dirt with a magnifying glass. I cannot see his name on that (laughs) album anywhere. Is it just a vocal dedication? Um, Because I can't find any actual... I official. think it. Well, I think it. Well, yeah, I think it was just. Uh, you know, this is a shout out. The, the, in terms of the context of the song, this is the kind of person who were thinking about. You know, somebody who tried to make a difference and got shot. How many people are going to have to go through this before things get better? You can't tell me John wasn't in his head as well when that song was being written. Wow, interesting. In what way? How how many people? You know, how oh. many people will it will it take? Mm, well. Uh, yes sorry yeah good point hadn't thought of that before i'll be honest i also liked paul's uh, musings over the next song as well that day is done yes and it's a song about regrets and how we all redo past scenarios and arguments in our head i was like paul mccartney's human he 
goes over his regrets in his head as well. That makes me feel much better. So yeah. thank you for, for uh, humanising yourself a bit there, Paul. Well, my, my, I don't know whether this is the case or not, but my understanding is that this is pretty much all an Elvis Costello song, I believe. Uh, a bit like how Back On My Feet is 98% Paul. Mm, I think this is pretty much an Elvis Costello song that ended up being Paul who did it. That's interesting. Yeah, and but of course that, that song as well gives us the title of the album in the lyric. Took me ages to figure that out, by the way. I just done <laughs> about 10 times before I heard, she leaves flowers in... The... He said the title! Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not the, the chorus or anything. Track, it's, just, yeah. Yeah, it's just hidden away in one line of the song somewhere. Uh, yeah, so I that, think that, that, that I'm sorry um, it'd be like calling pipes of peace dustbin lid <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly so yeah, yeah it's a good song it's quite a heavy song and I think lyrically uh, it doesn't surprise me if it is pretty much all an Elvis Costello song interesting I'm gonna have to do more research on that one I think uh, yeah but we've had a lot of truncated performances so far mm. and finally we come on to a song that in my opinion, deserves to be played in full. Mm. Of course, I'm talking about this one. If you want proof that this song might be a bit too complicated and this is kind of the Revolver Sergeant Pepper equivalent to Solo McCartney, you don't need to look any further than the fact that Linda has been relegated to the tambourine. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's a song about their relationship as well. Uh, she's very much uh, kind of the focus of this one. But I think this is one of Paul's great pop songs of the era uh-huh. this is one of those that if it had been released at a different time if he'd have if he'd have written this song and sung it in this kind of style in the mid 70s it would have been a number one smash mm-hmm. in britain in america all over the place it is a great, get rid of the note great... you never wrote put this on yeah. speed of sound oh my god yeah this is a great pop song and i won't be swayed on that and i get the impression you're not going to try <laughs> and sway me on that Nope, nope, <laughs> nope. Um, what, uh, I always try to avoid other podcasts' opinions on albums I've never come across, but I remember about five years ago I heard Robert Rodriguez and Richard Buskin agree that this is an amazing song, and I thought, fucking hell, they're agreeing on a Paul McCartney song. I've got to go check this out. Yeah. And the rest, as they say, is history. But I do maintain that this song was too complex for them to do live, yeah. and it's not satisfying on the Tripping the Life Fantastic album at all. No, I certainly prefer the version here on this documentary to what's on the album. I think this is a real nice version. I think think it's a bit slower. It feels a bit more relaxed. Which is weird, because normally when McCartney judges up a song for the live audience, something Mm. like, you gave me the answer, he normally cranks it up by about 15%. And unless it was kind of, it, it might have been that this was recorded early days in the tour rehearsals. Maybe they'd played it a lot recording it separate tracks but maybe they hadn't played it live together much at this point i don't know yeah and um you you can't forget that this did start out as a song on the um return to pepperland sessions Mm -hmm. and my god is the final product so much better than that this is one of the top examples of paul please revisit the songs you don't finish because normally when you do you make them even better yes water spout better be on mccartney for beautiful night being another example Yes. Uh, probably a good thing that he left it several years. <laughs> and we ended up getting a great song off the back of it. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's a really, really good song, this one. And, and, and I know we're kind of, we're right in the, this period of the documentary that we're in. This is the, this is the new song section. This is, this is, uh, this is showing songs that are going to be on Flowers in the Dirt. Mm. And I kind of, I, well, I made a list of the ones that, the, the songs that are on Flowers in the Dirt that didn't get featured in this documentary at all. And I think sort of largely he kind of made the right decisions, but there's just one particular song on the album that I think is missing that should have been got married. Exactly. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Maybe they couldn't, it could be a rights issue with Dave Gilmore. Maybe. You know, something, something like that. Cause you always see it on old albums appears courtesy of. Yeah. But then presumably Robbie learned all those parts because he would have been playing it live. They didn't they didn't sample in Dave Gilmore for the live shows, did they? So mm. sorry. So maybe it wasn't ready, maybe it took more learning, because I think this that song had been around a while anyway, hadn't it? They'd, 
Well, there was also um, a music video shot but never released, yeah. so maybe the intention was people will be introduced to it through the music video and there's no need to put it in here. But then again, My Brave Face had a, and this one had music video, so possibly not. Maybe so, maybe so, yeah. But I think, to me, in this, this section of the documentary that's focusing on the new songs, that's the one that I, oh, I would have liked to have seen a bit of We Got Married in there. But, hey-ho. Well, especially because... This is the Domestic Bliss album, mm. and, um, you know, thematically, it's absolutely perfect. Then we come on to the title track, mm. a song which I received on vinyl not two days ago. Excellent. Andrew, as someone who recently lost their dad, I literally cannot oh. objectively okay. look at this song. Okay, yeah. I can't. It just inspires the most raw emotion yep. from me. Understood. I mean, e- even reading... The liner notes by Jeff Baker on the back saying, you know, fathers would hold their sons' hands mm. and lovers would dance and stuff. Like, why are album liner notes that emotive? Like, Jesus. <laughs> you know, I I cannot say anything bad about this song. I loved it before yeah. that incident in my, in my life. But now, yeah. you know, what more can I say? No, that's understood. Because, um, yeah, I mean, Paul talks about it as well, doesn't he? And he's talking about, you know, no hair in a seagull's chest in his- He's kind of revisited that thing recently, hasn't he, with Egypt Station, where he'd do it now. He, he sort of said that was one of his, his dad's old sayings. And, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a cracking song. It, it's a really, really beautiful song. Um, the unexpected hit of the period, though, like, no one expected it to be a single. No one expected it to be a hit with the Parisian crowds. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the, the, the single benefited. I don't know if it benefited in terms of chart placings because it still didn't get high, but no, it didn't, the, the, no. the beautiful little surprise of that there's, there's two early 1970s wing songs on the single. Like, why? But thank you. So I'd, oh, yeah. So Mama's, Mama's Little Girl, and I, I'd never heard Mama's Little Girl until that single came out. I didn't know Same Time Next Year was on the 12-inch. I thought that was an unreleased track entirely. Right, so, yeah. Yeah, very interesting indeed. Yeah. I mean, it's still not as crazy as putting Lunchbox Odd Socks after <laughs> the live version of coming up. That's still, I'm like, why are there two B-sides on this, Paul? What is going on here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All I'm saying is Lunchbox Odd Socks probably should have ended Venus and Mars, but... We could talk about that another time. Yes, um, yes. I mean, according to my own head canon of that album, it actually starts with my carnival. So, <laughs> <laughs> which are, people are rolling in their seats right now. They cannot believe I've just said that. But, was it? Um, was it you that suggested that in my live stream last night? Yes, it, it was. was you. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I sh- and I shot that theory down. You shot that down <laughs> like like a Messerschmitt over London, yes. definitely. <laughs> then we come on to. F- another performance of Put It There, which baffled me. I was like, oh, they're literally playing this again. Thank God it's only two minutes long. And they put the coda at the end, which it's just one of the greatest ideas Paul's had for a little live Easter egg. You could definitely imagine people in the audience when he when he first did it going, hang on, what's... <gasps> you know, like that. Oh my God, he's doing that. Yeah. And I'd love him to, to do stuff like that more. Like, you know, end a song with, she loves you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think the only time the, uh, I've ever been blown away by an intertextual reference from the Beatles. You know? Yes, I think. Well, I mean, he's done a couple of things similar, hasn't it? Like he uh, he finishes "Let Me Roll It" with "Foxy Lady," doesn't he? <laughs> still, still to this day. And the other one, I suppose, in a kind of similar fashion, and on the Amoeba gig when he does "I'll Follow the Sun," and he just mm. and he just does this crazy amount of fake endings. So I'll follow the sun where he just comes back in with the chorus and then he even sort of takes his thanks from the crowd. And then 10 seconds later, Abe starts up with the on the drums and they come back in again with the, with the end of I'll follow the sun. So he likes a little fake ending now and again. Yeah. And, uh, I've become obsessed recently with Paul's like 30 second renditions of baby face. I don't know why, but I just love it. Then we come on to, Depending on your pronunciation, Snova Vizizyard, Chobba, or yeah. the Russian album. Andrew, did they not have enough footage or topics to make this all about Flowers in the Dirt? Or are they including this because they knew these songs were going to be included on the tour? I think it could be a little bit of both. I think certainly 
they have covered flowers in the dirt and the making of it a heck of a lot more than what they covered press to play in the press to play documentary. Right. So he's already given far more airtime to, to flowers in the dirt by this point. But I think, yeah, I, I suppose if, if he's going out on a, a multi-million pound potential tour, then featuring some of the stuff that, you know, oh, you're going to get to see Paul McCartney doing rock and roll. Fantastic. Um, that could be quite a, quite a draw for some people. Mm-hmm. Rather than the, rather than sort of covering ten songs from Flowers in the Dirt, rather than maybe just covering five of them, so I think I, I think this is this is definitely an advert for the tour as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's a it's a good little section of the documentary. Is this? There's some fun to be had here. It was also quite a cool album in Paul's perspective. You know, the idea that it was a bootleg and then it was in demand and people yeah. were. Ship, shipping it back over from the the uh, USSR, he's definitely throwing a bone for people there. Yeah, absolutely, and he must have enjoyed it so much. I think to for for that for him for him not just to have decided to make something that he could tour, but also for a lot of those songs to then carry forward into it, because he could have brought in another half dozen Beatles songs very mm-hmm. very easily, but he decided to have this rock and roll section, and that must have been. I, th- I think. I think the way I look at it is that both Paul and John turned to rock and roll at times when they felt they had to. Yeah, stressed. Yeah, I think I think in John's case, it was potentially. I, I don't think it was creatively a brilliant time for him, and it yeah, just meant there that was there it, was the lawsuit as well. Yeah, it was. Yes, um, it was an it was an easy thing for him to do at the time, and it meant that he could then sort of pack up and go and have a bit of a break with paul i think it's noticeable that the two times that he's done a rock and roll album one of them is off the back of the most slated creative uh, commercially received period he's ever had and he needed to get some confidence back Mm -hmm. the other time was after linda died and it was like the way that he got back into being able to Mm. sing and pick up a guitar again so I, i I mean, that, it might just be coincidence that those are the two times when he's done it, but I, th- I think there's some significance there that he's done it at times when it was it was the right thing for him to do at the time. I mean, how many times do you have to notice that whenever Paul is sad and things are going quite badly in his life, he seems to produce the best albums? Yeah. Ram, yeah. Band on the Run, McCartney 3 even? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. He needs to put his own back up against the wall, I feel. When McCartney's happy, I'm not happy. Mm. I also think there's a bit of a theory around Paul producing some of his best work at times when the Beatles have just loomed the largest in his life. So whether that's just after the Beatles have split up or whether it's... Uh, Flaming it, Pie, yeah. Yeah, Flaming Pie has just come off the back of the anthology with this. You know, he even talks in here, as you mentioned, about... You know, the be- the CDs have just come out now. Everybody's re-listening to the Beatles because it's out on CD. So he'd probably been re-listening to it as well. So I think there's also a bit of a correlation between when Paul has had Beatle business in his life. That that often then um, sort of coincides with him doing something pretty good after that. We need to get some statisticians on this podcast. Yeah, I might, I might have to get Microsoft Excel open and do some good graphs on this. Yeah, we're going to need the people from the big, short and margin call to uh, predict future <laughs> markets here. Yeah. So we then get a quick flurry of just because summertime Lucille and Ain't That a Shame for absolutely classic cuts from the Russian album. I just yeah. wish there was more of it, but I'm pretty sure in your version, it probably would have been a bit longer. I think this is where there are some differences here. So uh, he talked right at the start, he talks about his love for Elvis. Which, yes, you know, and, so, and how he hated him going in the army. And I'm like, yeah. yes, great and he, point. Paul. And he detects a little glint missing from his eye and he does his little Elvis <laughs> impression there. And then, yeah, it goes into Just Because. And I think this is one of the examples where you see just how fantastic Robbie McIntosh is as a guitarist. Mm. Uh, if you watch Just Because, just great sort of country-tinged rock and roll guitar. Fantastic. I mean, I, I can sort of play guitar. I wouldn't even know where to begin doing anything like what he does there. 
No, my, my, my favourite McCartney comment about the Russian album is in the liner notes where it's like, people always forget McCartney is a, a, a lead guitar player, but on cracking up, he really tears it up. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, calm down. It, yeah. it, 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 it's only cracking up, you know, yeah. <laughs> calm down there. Yeah. And, and he plays, also, uh, sorry, he plays lead uh, on Summertime as well. Do you have Summertime on the, on the shorter version that you watched? It's one of the longest tracks from this medley, actually. Okay, yeah, cool. Because I think, yeah, he plays lead guitar on that as well, doesn't he? Yeah, it was the second, well, the second day of the rehearsals for, for the Russian album was when he did the lead guitar, so possibly uh, they just carried that tradition on over yeah. to these ones. Yeah. Not quite sure, though. My main takeaway from this from this medley, though, was, oh, this is the worst version of Ain't That a Shame commercially available by Paul McCartney. Wow. Okay. It is. It is. Right. Uh, the, the one off the Russian album's way better. The one off <laughs> the Trip of the Life Fantastics, way better. This he, could, has to, yeah. he has to shred his vocals. He's, he's got to do the John Twist and Shout thing. And in here, he was quite clearly saving his voice to go to dinner later that evening. Okay. This could be where we have our first big disagreement. Bring it. You think I'm scared of you with your bigger YouTube <laughs> fan base? Do right. your worst, no. Andrew. Do your worst. Right. So ain't that a shame on this documentary, I think, <laughs> is incredible. I really do. This is one of my absolute favourite Paul McCartney live performances of all time. Oh, it's okay. I absolutely love it. I don't know what, it just, it just grabbed me the first time I saw it. Now, I think, I'm not sure that you've got the full version of the song there. Possibly not, and I will have to put my hands up there and say I can't give a fair assessment until I the full version of this movie right okay yes which has got the full version and yeah now there might be bits where he can't quite scream it in the way that he could have done 15 years earlier but i just absolutely love there's so much energy and that, that he puts into this it is it is incredible i think is this version of ain't that shame and i don't think he came close to it at any other time very interesting. Mm. I mean, for me, in Trip of the Life Fantastic, he goes, I want to cry! Like, he just really lets go. Like, for me, that's Long Tall Sally, Lucy, or yeah. Paul. And um, I felt like I was missing that just slightly here. I would like to think, if you saw the full version, that you might not think I'm as crazy as you currently think I am. We're going to have to put a pin in that one, ladies and gents. We'll have to do a rematch. Yeah. Uh it's, or we could just have a, a Twitter war, you know? Yeah. But I, I would I would honestly put that right up near the very, very top of my favourite Paul McCartney live performances ever, oh, is this version here. Oh, all right. There you, very interesting. Uh, there you go. Then we cut to Paul discussing the studio recording process. Yep. And in the vein of the stoned, giggly version of And Your Bird Can Sing from Anthology 2, mm. we get... Paul and Elvis <laughs> really messing up a take of My Brave Face, and it might be the highlight of the documentary for me. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I, I don't know whether there'd been anything happening before this to put them on the edge, but there's just that little bit where... So Paul Paul's there, he's sat on a, on a stool or something with his Rick and Backer bass, playing bass, and he just does this little ooh, run, up, run up, the ba up the fretboard of his bass, <laughs> and it just completely cracks Elvis up. And Elvis... You can't see him, but because the camera's focused on McCartney. <laughs> of course it is. And McCartney tells him to F off. And uh, they're just having, yeah, they're having a real good laugh. And it is very funny. And then I think, does it cut to the version where Paul's sort of uh, playing it on a keyboard as well? And he's, he's sort of doing shaky, wobbly legs. Yeah. It's a funny bit of footage because my bias take is that these weren't particularly pleasant sessions for either Paul or Elvis when they're in the same room together. Yeah. And uh, it was the most kind of uh, parallel partnership ever, you know, talking about, um, was it um, one of the songs well, it had to be like the human league and Elvis had to walk out the room and calm down before he actually yeah. told Paul what, what he thought of such a thing. <laughs> it makes me wonder whether this is like, you know how Peter Jackson's being accused of the biggest whitewash of history ever? Yeah. I wonder if this is Paul knowing, uh, me and I didn't end on great terms. I'll just use whatever positive footage we have. Mm. And if this was the only positive thing that happened, probably not. It, you know, there's probably lots of happy stuff, but this is a, a great example of 
the lighter side of that collaboration. Definitely, definitely. yeah. And I think they, the, the two of them must have enjoyed it enough that they, they have, they've appeared together on various things. At the since. fucking White House. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, they clearly still get along. And obviously, Paul recorded an album with Elvis's wife as well a few years back. So, yeah, they're, they're sti- clearly still on good terms. It didn't end like a, a, a Hugh Padgham kind of thing. Or, I mean, singing Warm and Beautiful at the concert for Linda certainly helped. Yeah, you would imagine, yes. Paul moves on to discuss demographics, which is fantastically shot down by him as a question. I oh. don't think about demographics. Yeah. Don't you, Paul? I don't <laughs> fully believe that. No, and he says, uh, yeah, because... Uh, Tracy asks him about who the album's targeted at, doesn't she? And he's, yeah, he's like, marketing men, thing like that. He says, I'm open to attract anybody, like a bloody dung heap. Which is quite a nice <laughs> quote. Yeah. yeah. Not quite sure what he means by that. As in a dung heap, as in attracting dung beetles? Oh, well, something? dung beetles are flies, I was thinking. Fly, uh, flies, yeah. yeah. That, ma- that, that makes sense. Yes. That makes sense. I think that's uh, what he was referring to there. Yeah, and then that's that's like a weirdly sort of short thing. I mean, it's it's probably included in the final edit because it's quite a funny thing when Paul says about it being a dung heap. But other than that, it's a really weird little thirty seconds to have in the documentary that's not related it's, to anything. <laughs> it's a real non non sequitur, isn't it? Yeah. Um, which brings us to something we talked about earlier, something mm. that you needed to address. I recognised the performance of Distractions as being the studio take because. It isn't Paul live with the band. It's him in black and white, yep. just with his bass. But this isn't the top of the pops performance I've per- I've pertained it to be. It's so th- this is the same. Uh, what you hear here is on the album, but the album version is embellished. So there's a little bit partway through where you just hear that there's just a little break between verses where you just hear a little bass run of Paul where he goes. Dum, 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 dum. And then it goes back into the song. Whereas on the album, that's been covered up with strings and such like. So it's it's kind of like not the final mix of the album, of, of the song. Okay. Why, why didn't they just do a band version of this, though? I don't know. I mean, I mean for example, you've got... Because the band came in at different points, they, did, they didn't all suddenly start on the same day. Maybe this was one of the early things that was done while Paul was still kind of... Because I know Wix didn't come in until later on. Robbie didn't mm. come in until after Hamish had been around a little while. So maybe was it one of the ones that was recorded early, earlier on? Well, there is the demo available on McCartney's website, and it is chalk and cheese mm. to the final version. Yeah. It is it is a stripped back as any version of Distractions could be. I think it's just him and a bit of percussion really a bit a bit a a, a bit of that uh buddy holly knee knee slapping uh, percussion you know Mm. interesting but yeah it's i think it's it's a lovely song for definite and uh it is nice i always think when i when i watch this documentary i do like that little bit that's different to the album version where you just hear the little bass run empty it's uh it's always a nice little reminder that uh it was still sort of playing around with different versions of it Oh, yeah, like the 80s is the Paul McCartney oh. remix Bonanza, isn't it? It's an absolute nightmare. For somebody like me who wants to have every version of a song that's been released when it comes to him, the 80s, I, I, I dread to think how many years of my life I've spent <laughs> gathering various things and, and knowing how to tag them in iTunes. <laughs> it's just yeah. an absolute mare. And like for someone like me who hates the single version of Pretty Little Head, I'm going to have to pay £70 for a single that I don't even like because <laughs> it's so rare. I think, I, think, I think the general consensus is that the single version of Pretty Little Head's the, the one to, to listen to. Oh, fuck the consensus. I mean, at least in the 90s, uh, Paul was clever enough to get all versions of Deliverance and all the remixes and just put it on one disc. Yeah, they were not very good though, were they? I love the Steve Sanderson oh, remixes. Yeah. <laughs> I can pop that on and just do some writing in the in the background. And then, you know, if someone in the house comes in and say, mm, what's this? This is good. And I'll say, it's Paul McCartney. And then they walk right back out the door. It's nice to do that sometimes, isn't it? To mess with people's... Uh... Secret friend. Yeah. Anything of McCartney too that's an instrumental, pop that on. People go, 
hmm, what's this? 1985 is a good one for that as well. Oh, okay. Gonna, I'm definitely going to try With that the one. younger generation. Then we come on to another stupid question asked by the uh, the interviewer. Is music... Could music possibly not be in your life? Mm. And he shoots that one down as well. I will play music as long as I'm alive. Yeah. So, I'm so not even hate. interested yeah. in that question. So there, Tracy. <laughs> I love how he puts interviewers at ease, you know. He's uh, he's so good at shooting something down politely. Yeah. I, w- I wonder if he knew that that question was going to be asked so that he could shoot it down. The worst question he was ever asked is when he's landing in America saying, are you too old to be playing rock and roll anymore? Mm. He was like 34 or something, wasn't he? <laughs> that question has also aged like bread. Yeah. I, I think it's. I think it would be a fair... Even if it was put to Paul now... Um, Paul, back in 1989, you were asked um, if you could conceive of a time when you wouldn't do music. What would? What do you think to that question now? I think if it was framed like that, I think it's worth asking him the question again to get his current answer to it. I think that applies to a lot of questions, Andrew. Mm. That'd be very interesting. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's quite... It's, it's, uh, it is quite funny, his response. You know, I'll, I'll do music as long as I do music. I'll live as long as I live. They're, they're too imponderables. They're so imponderables, I don't even waste time thinking about it. Okay. That's great. And I think that's the last we hear from him, isn't it? As uh, In terms of interview. Dialogue. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's then we're then kind of into the final little medley, aren't we, at that point? And I didn't want to have to talk about this song. I thought I was going to get through all of my Flowers in the Dirt coverage <laughs> without having to talk about this until a future Hot Hits and Cold Cuts episode. Yes. But, well, actually, let me first ask you, did you get the Flowers in the Dirt Japanese tour set? I did. The one that's got the other version of Party Party on. Oh, it's not this version of Party Party, then? I don't think so. There's, there's, there is more than one. Why is there more than one version of Party Party? This is a song that can't be held down within one version. So I'm I'm just looking at my screen now. I I have three versions of Party Party. Oh, oh my God! <laughs> um, and none of them are a party. No. At all. We've we've got the the version uh, Party Party from the. In fact, actually, I've got I've got more than three versions of this. Let's this just think. Depressing. Let's just think about this because there's uh, as well as having this version that's on here. So um, yeah, I've got. I've, Party Party from the Flowers in the Dirt World Tour Pack. Yes, I have, I have got that. I've got this that I tend to call the rock version from the Put It There documentary. There's a Party Party promo edit that came out in 1990 on a US promo disc called Paul McCartney Rocks. There's Party Party Club Mix that was in the archive oh collection. God. And there's the Party Party Bruce Forrest remix that I've got as a bootleg. So there I'm you go. exhausted after that. I'm exhausted, yeah. folks. My gosh. This 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 song deserves many versions. And yet I still don't have one official version of Return to Pepperland. This is proof <laughs> there is no God. Absolutely. Like, but th- this on. this to me, this version here is the only one that I give any time to, really. I get that. I get that. It's it it is just more fun because it's live. Yeah. It's like how the live version of P.S. Love Me Do gets slightly less flack. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, and, and you see the band fooling around. It's quite fun as well. It's, it's borderline dad dancing with the... Borderline? <laughs> the incredibly younger than you think he is, Robbie McIntosh, and Hamish sort of putting their, their head on the hands and doing this sort of little head dance thing. It's, it's just a nice little fun way to end the documentary, I think. But just like the album itself, want to end it with Ue La Sole, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that just doesn't appear at all in this, does it? Those keyboards, when it comes in in the second verse... Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Going back to Party Party, mm-hmm. though, I've got an internal conspiracy theory. I love talking heads, and I know that the band loved quad collaboration songs right. because a it pissed off david byrne and b it meant that everyone got royalties now there's a little part of me that wonders is this just paul giving everyone on the album a songwriting credit because it's a jam song and they all get a little royalty forever mm, well maybe so 
Uh, it's interesting. It could well be. Uh, I mean, you know, it's it's like flying. You know, Ringo will forever get royalty money from Magical yeah. Mystery Tour. You know, yeah. I mean, it's 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 one of those things where I was I was surprised that he did Wings Over America so early in the archive collection because there's quite, there's a fair bit that you know Denny Lane songs and, and he wouldn't have been getting a hundred percent songwriting royalties from that. I was, so he can be sort of kind of generous like that now and again. Yeah. So yeah, maybe so. You know, when like you think about when I get to the pearly gates, what question will I ask? Whatever deity is waiting there for mm. me. And one of them is, how much money did Denny Lane miss out on with the royalties for Mullock Tire? Can I just have a roundabout figure? <laughs> I think, did, did, did Paul buy him out on that eventually? Like a hundred quid, in su- oh, according God, to some sources. Oh, it is. Like, but when you go back and listen to the Paul McCartney piano tape from 74, 75, you swiftly realise Denny Lane didn't actually add a lot to this song no. at all. No, and I know Paul said, hasn't it, about when... There was a quote from him when Denny Lane had been saying something about not having been paid enough, and Paul said something like, "You know, I've got I've got receipts that shows that I paid him a million quid. You show me how many other people earned that much money in that time period." We all love Denny on this show. I'm yeah. from Birmingham. You saw Paul in Birmingham. Mm. I love Denny. Yeah. He, you know, I I would love to have a cup of Bovril with him yeah. one day, yeah. but. If I was to speak to him honestly, in the way that I'd love to speak to Paul honestly, I would love to sign a non-disclosure agreement and just go to dinner. And like I'll say, like I, you know, you can sue me for a million pounds if I ever mention anything spent here, said said here tonight. Yeah. And I'd just be like, look, Denny, how much did you fuck up your finances, man? How much was just spent on booze and drugs? Yeah. Or <laughs> did Paul screw you over? Be honest. I think it's the former. Yeah. How much did you spend on booze and drugs, and how much did you just waste? Yeah. Yeah. When I watched, the first time I watched Wingspan film, uh, I, I kind of realised that the Denny Lane was far more a star of that film than I was expecting him to be, in terms of what he contributed on that stage. It was it was far more than I expected. Mm-hmm. Oh no, e- even after that quite scathing conversation we've just had, Denny Lane's still massively underrated. Absolutely. Even if he's just a springboard for Paul to bounce ideas off, you know? Yeah. And people don't give Denny Lane the credit he deserves on so many instrumental parts. Like, both he and Paul are, are on the keys in Morse Moose and the Grey Goose. Mm-hmm. You know, Denny played bass, Denny, Den- Denny played lead guitar, rhythm guitar. He was so malleable and able to be wherever Paul needed him. And what are the two things that break up any friendship? What's the idiom? Money, money, money and, and women. women. And girls. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, not necessarily not necessarily women. Money and partners, yes. shall we say. Yes. I'm not going to exclude any, <laughs> anyone here, folks. But what came between John and Paul? Money and yeah. partners. What came between... Well, also, Danny wanted to tour, but that's because he wanted more money. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, he was a mu- he was a musician, you know. He didn't know any other life, did he? He had to go now. Hey, oh. hi oh <laughs> And then, with that, we come to the end credits, and Paul plays "Let It Be," which I actually didn't didn't expect, and that was a nice little treat. Except for the fact that he uses the eighty nine ninety growl, which annoys me to no end. And <laughs> we may well disagree again here because this is. I really, really love this version of Let It Be, just for the way that he attacks it. And again, yeah, there's, there's, there's times when he's not attacking it with the same voice he could have attacked it with years earlier. But I, I, just, I just love the energy in this version of Let It Be, and it's one of my favourite live versions of Let It Be. Even though, even got, though we only get a minute or so. He's got such a smile, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. He's, he's loving it. He's loving. Because Let It Be, I don't think... I mean, obviously, he did a few... Beatles songs in uh, in 76 but I'm pretty sure Let It Be wasn't one of them I don't think it was anyway uh, No because it, no. it, it was first debuted in the 79 tour Right yeah so he's, he's kind of brought it back a little bit there he did it at Live Aid and that kind of went quite badly and I think he's just loving the fact that I am going to go I'm going to go on stage on a big tour and I am going to play this song and he's, he's just like he's loving that 
and i think it's a really nice end to the documentary it's uh it's just it's just a nice little reminder to end on that actually yeah you know this is the guy that wrote let it be i'm i'm, I'm glad it's not hey jude at the end I, yes. i'd have probably loved it at the time if it was hey jude but looking back on it now with every damn version we've had of it i'm glad that it's one of his other big beatles classics that's at the end there I'm honestly surprised he didn't re-record it for yesterday, the movie. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And uh, that was uh, that was one where there was all that sort of uh, theory in advance about it. Is, is it at DePaul and Ringo appear in this? Are they going to be in it? And it sounds like that they, they they paid a hell of a lot of money to use those Beatles songs. That's the, that's one of the biggest things about that film. Is my God, mm-hmm. it's actually it's actually got Beatles music in it at the end. In Nowhere Boy, they don't even say the word Beatles for fear of legal action. <laughs> yeah, which is a shame. I mean, that's that's a good film. I like that. Film. It's a very good film. Yeah, it's I love the, um, the the in spite of all the danger that they do on there. Coincidentally, though, uh, the original book it was based on, co-written by Jeffrey Giuliano. Oh, was it? And, yeah. Yeah, and I need the one of the reasons I want to get him back on is to go through how he may or may not have been screwed out of that. Right. Um, very interesting, potentially. Yeah, they, did, they did use a um, a demo of Mother at the end, didn't they? Or one of the early takes of Mother as the end credits. Yes. So I presume that was all official and authorised. Mm. It must, must have been. Yeah, but Mad Men wouldn't pay $250,000 to play Mother. No. <laughs> $250,000 to play Tomorrow Never Knows. That's one of my favourite trivia facts ever. Who, who paid that? So in the um, AMC show Mad Men, in one of the episodes where they take LSD, okay, they play A Day in the Life in full in the middle of the wow. episode, and it cost them $250,000 for the privilege. <laughs> On the crown, you sort of see occasionally there'll be something like Starman by Bowie, and you just th- it just sort of hits you as, my God, this is a big budget program. If, they're, if they've got the rights to that, that ain't, that ain't coming cheap. They need to cancel The Crown and put all those resources into a 12-season Beatles show. Each season covers a year and an album. You keep the same cast. You actually cast 16, 17, 18-year-olds in the roles. Yeah. And let's see what happens. But we are going to have to wait till Danny, James, Stella, until until they've all gone. We're not going to be alive to see the ultimate Beatle (laughs) Beatle project. Yeah, I mean, I... When the Yesterday film came out, I got asked a question on YouTube by a, a guy called Rami who watches my videos, and he sort of said, "Do you think there'll be um, do you think there'll be another biopic?" And, and and I did a video based on it afterwards, sort of what could be next in terms of like a Beatles biopic, and I could certainly see a John Lennon one. I could certainly see uh, something happening there. We, we've got Nowhere Boy covering his early life, mm-hmm. and I could absolutely imagine Yoko wanting to authorize something covering the 70s like their their story like the john and yoko story and that could be quite a big budget thing a dramatized version of the u.s versus john lennon basically yeah something like that and and for paul you know you, you could have a story that's sort of dealing with how he coped with the breakup of the beatles and i think i think a perfect paul biopic would be how he went from being beetle paul to broken paul to being on a massive stage in 1976 filling out arenas see this is so similar to an idea i had for a a mccartney script that actually started writing at one point it would start with the death of john yeah and it's him going over the 70s in in his mind okay unfortunately though that there there is a movie called two of us yes with uh, jared harris yeah it's complete hogwash in terms of historical inaccuracy but in terms of capturing the feeling of what we wanted their final conversation to be yeah oh oh it's outstanding yeah it really is yeah and they smoke a joint in it as well i was like yeah <laughs> go on lads you cheeky boys <laughs> go on i heard paul yeah. said sort of in theory he was he was kind of okay with that two of his movie he said the general the sort of gist. very high level um gist of what's going on is is pretty much there I mean, obviously, they couldn't have any uh, have had any knowledge of what conversations went on, and he, he realizes that he appreciates the fact he wasn't going to slag them off because he knew that they had to just sort of literally make that up. But he said, as a, as a high level concept, he said, yeah, he, he was quite sort of complimentary about it. 
Maybe Paul will say the same thing about my Yellow Submarine remake slash sequel slash prequel. That would be... <laughs> I, 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 I hope he gets to see that on his desk for approval. <laughs> you know what? Let's wrap this up. Overall, is this documentary, put it there, is it essential? Is it a must-have purchase for a budding McCartney fan? Or is this the men love avenue of documentaries? It's um, it's it's a weird one for me to answer because I'm sort of I'm completely wrapped up in it from the point of view of this was this is where I entered the story as mm-hmm. a fan. So it's uh, and I, I try and look at it objectively. And I think if you were to list if you were to list everything that Paul McCartney's done in order of cultural importance with them. Um, you know, Sergeant Pepper at the top. This is much closer to P.S. Love Me Do down at the bottom than it is to Sergeant Pepper. But I will always have a very, very special place for this documentary in my heart. I have watched this documentary way more times than I have watched any other documentary that exists on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that, but that says a lot more about me than it says about this documentary. I think I personally love it but I am very wrapped up in it because of the time frame of when it came out. Certainly if anybody sort of says, if, if I ever hear anybody say, Oh, flowers in the, I quite like flowers in the dirt. I've just started listening to that. Oh, you want to see this documentary, then put it there about the making of it. I would certainly recommend it. I would never, ever try and shy somebody away from it. Uh, like I might do with, with certain other things that he's been involved in. So, I mean, I know it's not perfect. It's uh, It's got some cheesy fashions in it. But again, that's when it was made. <laughs> what, what can we expect? It's got some, It's it's got these special effects that are very much of the time. But again, that's the time it was made. So I think as a documentary of what fashions and TV special effects looked like in 1989 and of what he was about to become, because this is, this is very much him entering the new phase of his career, embracing the Beatles. This is kind of the birth of that. So I think it's quite important in that respect for a Paul McCartney fan to be aware of this documentary. But I realise that there are, it it doesn't need to be at the top of anybody's list for a new fan. You know, there's other things I'm going to guide you towards first before watching this. I totally agree with you there. I really can't say much different. The only thing I will say is if someone is reticent about trying to find the dvd copy or or a vhs Mm -hmm. or they don't want to buy the big re-release the truncated versions on youtube yeah it's not very good but no i managed to get a three and a half hour podcast out of it absolutely like 80 to 90 percent of it is there on that you know if you can get hold of the full version it's going to look a little bit cleaner and you're going to get slightly more slightly longer version of some songs but generally you've got most of the full thing there absolutely Andrew, I believe we've come to the end, my friend. Wow. Thank you so much for coming on, man. This is this has gone probably a lot better than you thought it would, eh? I think probably n- has anybody in history ever talked for three and a half hours about the Put It There documentary. I'm not sure that I'm not even sure that the production team who made the documentary spent that much place time yeah. spent this long <laughs> planning it. But no, it, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me onto your show. As you said, it is the first time I've ever done anything like this, and uh, yeah, yeah, it, we, I think we got there and. <laughs> But yeah, thank you for having me, definitely. Put it there if it weighs a ton, Andrew. Oh, there's no hair on a seagull's chest, Sam. Is it che- seagull's ch- chest or back? Chest. Definitely oh, that's chest. such a weird phrase. I didn't, I, I didn't I, watch this documentary 50 times to not <laughs> know that it's no hair on a seagull's chest. I typed that into Google and uh, one of McCartney's half-sisters mentioned it in a, in a, in a blog post oh, as right. well. So it's definitely a legit yeah. Jim McCartneyism, yeah. 100%. Yeah, sound, oh, good. I've never researched it to that length. <laughs> Andrew, how can people find your stuff, man? Uh, so on uh, on YouTube, if you type in Andrew Dixon, that's D-I-X-O-N, and uh, that should come up with a picture of my ugly mug. And I think there are, I think other Andrew Dixons are available on YouTube. But they're things like doctors and and american football players or rugby players or something like that so yeah andrew dixon google me if you, if you put andrew dixon paul mccartney that, that'll get you there i'm sure 100 percent. and folks i don't just say this because he's a guest on my show i'm saying this because i've really had fun going through all of his content please links down below they will all be there go check out andrew's channel because it's just 
packed to the brim with the, the kind of Paul McCartney and Beatle content that I wish I could cover, but I can't. And thankfully, <laughs> someone else does. Thank you. Uh, again, man, thank you so much for coming on this show. I'm so glad we, we were, we were t- to talk for so long because mm. you are more than welcome to come back, my friend. So yeah. hopefully I'll be seeing you sooner rather, rather than later. Yeah, let's, uh, let, let's get a topic that, uh, that we can chew over and uh, that would be very good. As long as it's not a single disc white album, we should be all right. Uh, that, uh, that's too controversial, is that? It's the Beatles white album. Shut, Shut up. up. <laughs> oh, it, it, the top ten McCartney quotes, possibly. It's, yeah, I, th- I don't think he's ever repeated that one though, has he? That's that was a one-off, but it was a great one-off. He was actually frustrated. Like, but the best bit about that, he's having a dialogue in his own head, yeah. which is really funny. He's having an <laughs> argument with, with with himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was oh. fun. It's like, you know, he says, I saw someone carrying a copy of Wildlife in California once, so someone must have liked it. <laughs> Everyone, you've been listening to another episode of Paul or Nothing. I've been speaking with Andrew Dixon from the Andrew Dixon YouTube channel, and we have been discussing, for the best part of four hours, the Put It There documentary from 1989. If you want to drop me an email, let me know your thoughts on this album. Maybe you have access to the full copy somewhere, and you could point us in the right direction. Maybe you were the guy that supplied the four TVs so that they could do all, all of the weird effects for this. If you have anything to say about this at all, please drop me an email at paulmccartneypod at gmail.com. Follow us on the Twitter, the Instagram, the YouTube, the, the blog. Leave us a review on iTunes and check out our Patreon if you fancy throwing some money at my face down the internet every month. Thank you so much, folks. Next episode should be possibly... Band on the Run, Listen with Sam, one of the most overdue episodes in this show's history. See you all very, very soon. Peace and love, peace and love. Play us out, Denny.